Um, so I'll introduce myself really quick. Uh, my name is Lauren um, Compton. I was a dancer with the Valley 58 company for five years. And while I was there, I also um, eventually, <laughs> um, I think it was the maybe second or third year was um, the became the director for the conservatory program and um, also worked as their ballet mistress so I wore a lot of hats while I was there. Um, my background in training is Vaganova so I trained under a man named Nicholas Macatelli in um, Denver and actually I think he was in Michigan for quite a while so some of you from Michigan might know of him I'm not sure but um, he is from um, the country of Georgia, so has a very strong Vaganova background. And so I trained mostly under him and then um, ended up going to college for a few years, thinking I was going to go into pre-physical therapy. I was still training at the same time. And then I decided, nope, I'm going to go for ballet. <laughs> and so I went and got further training with um, Kelsey Kirkland at her school. And then... Um, <laughs> Um, auditioned and got into Ballet 58 and danced with him for five years. Um, in the middle of that, uh, my, oh, I've got to let somebody, here you go. Um, married my, who's now husband, who is in medical school. So when he was finished with medical school, he got his residency in San Antonio, Texas. So that's where I've been um, ever since and just been focusing on teaching. I taught for a school here for a while and then kind of in the startup of all the pandemic, um, Ballet 58 asked me to come back in and teach online <laughs> for Ballet 58 now. Um, so I've been teaching the advanced classes and also um, the instructor insights classes. And um, I've also started my own private coaching and mentorship um, group here. So I've got about five kids that I'm coaching. Um, so the Overall, the topic of this class is training turnout properly in classical dancers. And um, so I realize some of you might not be coming from a really classical background where you're teaching ballet as a supplement to other styles in your schools, or maybe you are a classical ballet school, but um, just so you know where I'm coming from, it's from that really classical background and, and hope you can just take from this what you can apply to your own studios So um, and classes. I'm going to share my screen. I've got um, PowerPoint today, so hopefully that'll help with you guys following along with some notes. But okay, can you guys all see that? Okay, awesome. <clears throat> okay, so the first the thing I thought we should kind of discuss is why are why is it important to even talk about turnout? And um, through teaching through Ballet Five Eight now, some of the the girls are able to have you know private lessons through the program, and um, several of them shared with me they're like we've never really talked about turnout in ballet class before, and I was just sort of floored. It was like, how do you do ballet and not talk about turnout? Um, I think there's a lot of um, concern in talking about turnout and training turnout wrongly. Um, but I think it's really important that we do train it in the right way. Um, and I, I found this quote in one of the resources that I use um, frequently, and I have a lot of resources for you guys at the end as well. But um, the quote is, the subject of turnout has long been a source of misunderstanding and contention, especially among those who do not fully understand the technical precepts involved. In sorting through men, the many misconceptions, we can be sure of one fact, though all dance techniques utilize a turned out position of the legs to a greater <clears throat> to a greater or lesser degree, should be or <laughs> classical ballet is based on the turnout. Without it, the technique cannot exist. Far from being primarily an aesthetic concept, the turnout has a profoundly functional role. So I think um, as we're talking about turnout and if we're training classical ballet, we can't train classical ballet and not train turnout. Um, in doing that, we give our dancers not only the aesthetics for classical dance that they need, but there's a lot of stability function and things that come along with it um, as well. So I think the consequences of training turnout poorly or ignoring training turnout um, first we can lead to injury. If we're not developing the muscles correctly, it puts a lot of strain on the knees and ankles. And so we can um, give our dancers, 
you know, chronic injuries that they develop from faulty training. Um, we also use certain muscles um, or overuse certain muscles, particularly the gluteus maximus, usually in dancers because they're trying to turn out but not doing it from the right place. And that ends up actually restricting movement and creating tightness and not allowing them to be as, um, uh, have as much plasticity and mobility and freedom in their movement in their legs. Um, when we train <clears throat> turn out poorly, we also lose a lot of the function of the hip joint. We're not maximizing the function of the hip joint and enabling our dancers to achieve the greatest potential of their movement. Um, when we train turn out poorly and actually when we don't use the full extent of the turnout, we actually are building bulky and stiff muscles rather than that kind of long, lean, elongated muscle. Um, usually poor training and turnout is coupled with poor, not all the time, but a lot of times is um, coupled with poor control of the spine and pelvis. And I feel that usually comes when dancers are trying to push the turnout too much from the wrong place and they're ignoring what's happening with the spine and the pelvis. You know, the goal is just to have your legs in a certain position or just to have your leg at a certain height and we're ignoring the um, control of your spine and pelvis. Um, the benefits of proper training are we prevent injuries as we talked about before because we're working from the right place we have a lot of precise control over what our body's doing. Um, we create stability, we increase our range of motion mobility and strength of the entire body so we're like fully utilizing the ability that our body has for dance. Um, it promotes that elongated shape of muscles. We talked about that a little bit. Um, and it encourages concepts we're gonna talk about later like um, hip disassociation, which means that we're maintaining our proper pelvic and spinal alignment and we can disassociate the movement from our hip so that the leg is moving on its own without moving the entire body. Um, I think there's two dangers in training turnout, two opposite ways that we could go that are both equally as bad. Um, the first is I think what a lot of teachers are, um, I think, especially American teachers, I feel like are more scared of pushing students beyond the strength of their capabilities, right? So, um, sorry, I'm going backwards. Um, the first danger is pushing students beyond the strength and capability of their bodies that results in injuries. You know, the goal is just to have your feet here. I don't care how you get there, but make sure that it's 180 degree turnout. Um, again, that results in injury and weakness and lack of mobility and an inability to perform movements with clarity and control. Um, you know, maybe a student can stand in first position, but as soon as, or in a turned out position, as soon as they start to move, they lose all of that turnout. Um, I think the other side of it is that we are, can be afraid to go to that extreme of pushing students too far and we don't push them far enough in their use of their turnout. And, and again, that's gonna um, result in a limit of their strength and control and mobility and create those kind of bulky stiff muscles. Um, I liked this quote from Valerie Grieg again from Inside Ballet Technique that's um, take care must not be misconstrued as do nothing. So just because we're taking care and being very careful about how we're training turnout doesn't mean that we're not doing anything and we're not pushing the students to the maximum of their potential. Um, some important concepts we're going to talk about. So there's a lot of information in this. I'm going to try to go fairly quickly through it so we have time for questions at the end. Um, but hopefully this is just an overview and we could probably have like a, you know, 10 hour class just on now. But um, if there's any questions, please, you know, save them for the end and, and we'll just try to keep moving to get through as much as we can. But Okay, several concepts that we're going to be talking about is um, I pulled these from Dance Anatomy, Dance Anatomy, which is a book by Jackie Greenhouse, which is a wonderful resource. Um, but the first thing is to think about our pelvis as the link between our spine and our our lower limbs. So um, she says the majority of injuries occur in the lower extremities. If these injuries are not acute, meaning they occur suddenly. 
then they are related to faulty technique. Faulty technique usually occurs from poor alignment in the lower spine and pelvis, <clears throat> and the iliopsoas muscle is the magic link that connects the lower spine with the pelvis and the femur. So as we're talking about turnout, it's spinal and sorry, control of the spine and pelvis cannot be separated from talking about turnout because if we don't have the stability of the pelvis, which is the link between your spine and your lower legs, um, we can't make it work. So we need both at the same time. Um, and we're really not going to talk about core stability so much today as the turnout. And we're gonna do a class in the future on core stability through Instructor Insights. So keep your lookout for that. But um, we really have to realize and understand that really crucial and important connection, especially if we're going to maximize the turnout and also prevent injury in the lower extremities. Um, the second one, which I had mentioned a little bit before is hip, hip disassociation, which is isolating movement at the hip, which is self separate from the pelvis or the spine. Um, and if you understand the principle of core, the core musculature inserting into the pelvic region and leg movement starting at the pelvic region, so basically that pelvic link, then imagine you're moving your thighs at the hip joint only. So we have this link between the spine and the pelvis. And then from there, we want to think about only moving the thigh within the hip joint rather than using the pelvis to move the lower leg. So that's what hip disassociation means. Um, we also want to think of our movement in our lower limbs as really precise movement. Um, that's like, you know, in ballet the, and dance, I think in general, the aesthetic of it is your arms and upper body is the artistry and it can be much more fluid and there is precise movement, but our lower extremities are, we're working on a really high degree of refinement and precision of um, how our legs are moving. So, you know, Precise movement requires accuracy co and coordinated speed of the contractions of your muscles. And that's what we're trying to train in our students and particularly related to turnout. Um, so what are we really trying to achieve in training turnout? I think a lot of dancers um, and students that I've talked to are either told or believe that they have quote unquote bad turnout. And in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, there's a lot of different positions that our bodies need to turn out in. So we need to have turnout on the standing leg. We need to have turnout in fondue or on plie. We need to have turnout to the front. We need to have turnout all a second and retire to the back. So most of the time, students will be good at one or two of the areas and bad at others. Usually I find because of the way that bodies are built and hips are set, um, you'll either have really good turnout front and back and it'll be harder to the side or it'll be really easy to the side and harder front and back. And it's not that we can't improve in the directions that we're weaker. It's just, uh, I think it's good to help students understand where their strengths and weaknesses are and not just label themselves as having bad turnout. Um, there's also a lot of contributing factors to turnout. A lot of it is, you know, mobility, but a lot of it is strength. I find that most dancers have a lot more turnout and potential for turnout than they realize. Um, there's uh, some contributing factors I've listed here. So we can have actual restrictions in the body. The restrictions can come in different um, ways. They can be bony and anatomical restrictions, um, which are things that are not really going to change, especially in our dancers who are like 10, 11 and older. Um, there's muscular restrictions where we just have muscles that are too tight that are not allowing our body to move. And we can have fascial restrictions. Um, and if you don't know what fascia is and you haven't studied it as a teacher, it's like a whole nother rabbit trail, but um, really highly recommend um, educating yourself and understanding how fascia works in your body. It's all the connective tissue. Um, and it's, you know, in dance medicine more and more and more, they're realizing how much of a contributing factor it has in um, not only stability, but really the flexibility and mobility in your body. Um, so the other contributing factors are we can just have weakness in the muscle, in the turnout, deep turnout muscles, um, and then poor alignment and control of the spine and pelvis. Even if we have that strength of the turnout muscles and we have the mobility of the legs, if we're not creating a strong base to work from, there's not a whole lot you can do with that turnout. So um, we, oh, I don't know what happened. We want to look at all of these areas when we're um, training our dancers. 
So very, very fast anatomy of the hip, just so we are, um, all know we're on the same page. Can you guys see my arrow moving on the screen? Okay, um, so just like general bones and probably a lot of you know this already, but um, this big bone here is the ischium. You have two, ish, two. I'm not sure if that's pl plural, I think it's both. You have one ischium and two ischium, but anyway, you have two ischium <laughs> that connect together. Um, and we have this iliac crest, which goes over the top, which is a really important connection for muscles. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. I'm not sure what's happening. And then we have these two ischial tuberosities at the bottom, which are also really important connecting points for muscles and um, tendons and ligaments. So then we have our sacrum and coccyx and cox sacrum here, coccyx is your tailbone um, in the middle connecting the two ischium. And those are also really important um, connecting points for muscles. Um, we have the acetabulum, which is kind of the bowl, like the socket of the ball and socket of your hip joint. And we have the head of the femur, which is kind of the ball that sits into the acetabulum. And then we have um, this number seven over here is your greater trochanter and your lesser trochanter is number eight. And those are really important points, again, where muscles are connecting. Um, so when we talk about turnout, um, I think, especially in um, younger dancers and a lot of dancers that I've worked with, there's just a really uh, lack of understanding or misunderstanding of where your turnout actually comes from. And these um, turnout muscles are called the deep six turnout muscles. They all work as a group to turn out your leg. That's pretty much their only action. Their main action is to rotate the femur. So um, while other muscles are going to assist these muscles and they're recruited in different positions. So for example, when you um, take your leg to the back, your biceps femoris, which is part of your hamstring group helps to the turnout. Um, when you are standing in turnout, the lower fibers of the gluteus maximus are helping the turnout. But when you lift the leg to the front, those lower fibers have to release and let go. So um, while there's other muscles that help with the turnout, these are the muscles that are working all the time and need to be recruited throughout the entirety of the movement. So these are the ones we're really gonna focus on isolating and strengthening. Um, just one really, I feel like most important muscle is the quadratus femoris, which is down here between the ischial tuberosity and the femur. Um, and that one's particularly important in standing turnout. Um, I'm gonna talk about him later, so I just wanted to point that out specifically. Um, another really big one is the piriformis, which attaches from the sacrum to the femur over here. Um, that one plays it's one of the harder working ones. So um, the other muscles that assist in turnout are the lower fibers of the gluteus maximus. So kind of this area here, um, your sartorius, which I don't have a picture of, but basically comes from your femur, comes across the, and attaches to the inside of your knee. So that one plays a big role in supporting turnout, especially like in retire, um, when the leg is kind of in a flexed and side position. Um, your adductors in certain positions can play a really big supporting role when it's the standing leg and when the leg is the front. Um, biceps femoris, which is a part of your hamstring, assists to the back. I think um, it's also important to know which muscles are, are internal rotators. Um, so two of our hamstrings, you have biceps femoris and then two other hamstring muscles, semi-tendinosis and semi-membranosis. And I'm sorry, I just abbreviated there, <laughs> but um, those muscles act to turn you in. Um, the anterior fibers of your glute med and glute min gluteus medius and gluteus minimus. Um, and then our tensor fascia latte, which is this muscle coming from the hip here and it attaches to your IT band. Um, a lot of times when we're using turnout improperly or um, particularly when our stability is not coming from the right place, the glute med 
Min and uh, Tensor Fascia Latte or TFL will get really tight because they're working to try to stabilize the pelvis when other muscles aren't working. And so I always tell my dancers, like, if we're not finding stability in the right place, we're making these muscles tighter and these muscles are working to turn you in. So it's counteracting your turnout, um, which is not helpful. Um, really important muscles for our pelvic stability is the gluteus medius, particularly on the standing leg, um, the iliopsoas, which is that magic link that we talked about earlier. So it's connecting the spine. It connects on the front of your spine, runs through, and then attaches on kind of that rim of the pelvis on the inside of the pelvis. So that's this, it's actually made up of two muscles, two heads here, but it's the psoas and the ilia, iliacus. So we combine them together, the iliopsoas muscle. Um, the adductors are also really important for pelvic stability and the pelvic floor muscles. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk then about assessing um, restrictions in our students and how we can help them to gain mobility. So um, if I know Hannah's taken my instructor's insights class before, and I always talk a lot about Lisa Howell. Um, and if you don't know who Lisa Howell is, I just highly recommend you, all of her resources are fantastic. She's a physical therapist from Australia who danced herself and um, has just spent her career in physical therapy helping dancers and has come out with just some amazing resources for dancers and for teachers and has really I think been innovative in um, finding better ways to help dancers that work with kind of like the fascial system and the muscular system more rather than saying oh well your body can't do it you'll never have good feet you'll never have good turnout she's really come a long way in um finding what what are the contributing factors to these things and how we can help dancers to improve. Um, so a lot of this is from her um, program training turnout. Um, she uh, gives four kinds of restrictions that you can look for when we're assessing our students. We want to look for bony restrictions, neural restrictions, fascial restrictions, and muscular restrictions. And as you're testing your dancers, you can ask them to pay attention to how it feels when they're getting to the end of their mobility. And that tells us a lot about what kind of restriction we're dealing with. So if I'm testing my leg, let's say like in um, taking it to the side and turning it out, if I feel a hard stop, then that's a bony restriction. Um, in bony restrictions, there's usually not a whole lot we can do with that. And we don't want to push into it and force our students past that point. Um, so be really careful when students feel just like a hard stop. Um, the next one is a neural restriction. So that's when you feel kind of like a thin line of pain um, that goes, you know, for a long way. <laughs> um, and a lot of times muscular and fascial restrictions will cause neural restrictions. So um, when we feel that neural restriction, we want to kind of follow the same path as the fascial and fascial restrictions to release that. Um, fascial restrictions are a tightness in that connective tissue. And um, when you feel a fascial restriction, it's going to be just a general sense of pulling in a, the whole area. Um, when there's a muscular restriction, you'll feel the, the stretch kind of deep in the belly of the muscle. So um, I think this is really helpful because um, I like thinking back on my training <laughs> when I was younger, but like, oh, I just need to stretch more. Like if I felt a pull in the back of my hamstring and thinking back more, it's like, well, that was actually a fascial pull of my hamstring. It would have been a lot more helpful to do other things rather than feeling this stretch like deep in the belly of my hamstring. Um, so this can give us really good clues on how to help our students. Um, so yeah, some dancers will have real anatomical restrictions. One of them is femoral antiversion, which is um, a specific angle of the femur, which I'm not gonna get into a whole lot right now, but um, if you have a student that's finding that they have like this kind of bony restriction feeling, they like just are not able to access turnout um, in a good way, they may have other things going on like femoral antiversion that will prevent them from turning out. Um, but there's a very small percentage of kids that have that. We do need to be on the lookout for it. But in general, dancers can achieve a great degree of rotation by mobilizing and strengthening. 
Um, so specific tests for restrictions. We're gonna test our standing leg turnout, our turnout in plie and fondue, our um, turnout and turn in at 90 degrees to the front and our turnout in second position or ala sacone. So I'll show you guys these in a second, but we want to, when we're doing this, we want to ask students to be perceptive of what they, where they feel the restriction. Are they feeling it in the front of the hip? Are they feeling it in the side of the hip? In the back of the hip? Is it a pinching in their groin? Um, and then also what that restriction feels like. Does it feel like a fascial pull? Does it feel like a general pull of the area? Are they feeling a stretch in the belly of their muscle? Are they feeling kind of a pinching? Are they feeling a, that hard stop? Um, so you want to ask a lot of questions about how they're, where they're feeling it and what it feels like, um, and that can better direct us. Um, I also wanted to know if there's any pain that dancers are feeling in their sacrum or in their low back, they really need to consult a health professional because um, there can be, you know, SI joint dysfunction and other things that are going on that really need to be addressed by a, a PT that sees them. So, um, okay, sorry. Let me go back. So the tests for these um, for these areas. So the first one you can test by having students lay on the floor. And you're going to actually have them put their feet partway up the wall in parallel, um, probably about uh, three or four inches. And then you're just going to have them using as little muscle activity as possible turn out the legs as far as they can. And then you can measure if you want to the degree that they're able to turn out. But that's how you're gonna test how much standing leg, strength of standing leg turnout and mobility they have just with their legs um, without standing on the floor. So uh, let's see, the next one we wanna test is turnout in plie. So for that one, we're also going to do it laying down. And it's good to have the student just relax their legs and you are doing this test to the student. So you're really just testing mobility and not strength. Um, but you want to have uh, stabilize their supporting hip and then have them cross and put their heel on like their shin, right? And then just see how far their knee is gonna go to the floor. And you can take a measurement between their knee and the floor just to track um, their turnout and how far they're going. But uh, so that's the test for plie or fondue, turnout and plie or fondue. Then we want to test the turnout 90 degrees to the front. So you're going to have them start with the knee um, over their hip and then slowly turn out the leg this way. And we want to ideally get to a 90 degree angle, but we want to pay attention where, what angle are they at so we can track. And then also where are they feeling um, the stretch or restriction. Um, we also want to do the same thing testing. And again, this they're complete rela completely relaxed and you're the one moving their leg carefully to see how much range of motion they have. And the second one is turn in. We want to do the same thing. They want to be about half of the range that they had turned out. So if they're at 90 degrees turned out, we want to have about half of that 45 degrees turn in at 90 degrees. And again, paying attention to what does the restriction feel like? where, um, all that. So the next one is turnout in second position or an oscillate. So this is just taking the knee to the side. Um, you know, are they feeling it in their inner thigh? Are they feeling a pinching in the front of the hip and the groin, whatever? Where's, where are they feeling that restriction? We want to stabilize this hip so it's staying on the floor. And again, you can kind of measure the knee to the floor or just observe how flat they are across the front. So those are the tests for all of those positions. Okay, so <clears throat> these are common areas of restriction that are related to these like mobilizing tests that we just did. So if your students are feeling a restriction or a pull in the front of their hip, um, I've listed, so these are the areas of restriction and I've list, listed the related mobilizers. And this is certainly not a comprehensive list. There's a lot of things you can do, but it can start to give you an idea of the kinds of things that are gonna be helpful for each kind of restriction and what kind of mobilizers we're focusing on. So 
please don't take this as, as like, these are the only exercises and mobilizers you can do, but it gives you an idea of where to start. So the front of the hip, um, uh, and really the kind of the front side, the anterior lateral part of your hips, so front and, you know, front and side-ish here, um, particularly can be restrictive in standing like turnout. If this is tight, it's gonna make it really hard to rotate. But some helpful um, mobilizers for that are hip flexor releases. Um, and of course, I think probably all of us hopefully know this um, hip flexor release where we're making sure the pelvis is really upright and then we're going into the stretch this way. Um, in Lisa Howell's programming, she recommends a lot of dynamic um, mobility. So a good one for this is you're gonna go in this way, turn the hips out to the side, come back to the center, do a little reach over, and then go a little bit deeper, and then come back. So you're, you're stretching, but you're kind of trying to glide the fascia at the same time, so we're not just sitting in a position and stretching. Um, another good hip flexor release from Lisa Howell is um, you're gonna take sort of a lunge position, kind of feel like you're a carousel horse going up and down. We're trying to open here, keeping the pelvis really upright and just, you're gonna reach the back heel down and bend the knee and come back up. So kind of something like that. You can also add a reach over to the side that um, releases that iliopsoas muscle a little bit deeper. So things like that, hip flexor releases and mobilization are really helpful for the front of the hip restrictions. Also, um, anything stretching that quad muscle or the rectus femoris, a really good one, and I don't have a chair with me, that to be helpful, but um, see if I can demonstrate it. You're gonna put your knee on top of a chair and take this foot a little bit out. And similar to the hip flexor stitch, where you're kind of bending into it and stretching. Eventually you can have students take their foot. So if my chair is this way, they're gonna take the foot and rest it on the back of the chair and then do the same mobilizer. So they're really opening up in the front of the quad. Um, Anything stretching the TFL, a really good one is to, sorry, I'm going through super fast. I think there will be a recording. Um, to lay down on your back, open your feet really wide, take your foot across, and then open up the front side of the hip. And that's a really nice stretch through the kind of that tensor fascia latte muscle. Um, so for the lateral hip, so that's kind of our glute knee, that's this area here, if we're feeling restrictions there, particularly um, lifting the leg to the front, turn out to the front, um, can be affected by restrictions in this area. So releasing the glute knee with a tennis ball is really helpful. Um, and hopefully at the end, I wanna go over like a full tennis ball release and how to do that, but I'll, I'll say that. Um, a little bit later. Um, the fire log pose stretch. So that's this one where you're stacking the feet over the knees and relaxing forward. If students have a really hard time with this one, it's better not to have them stretch like this where they can't get their legs on the floor. It's better to have them sit on a yoga block or a stack of pillows so they can stretch comfortably with their knees relaxed down, work on their breathing, and then slowly remove a pillow at a time or remove the yoga block. Um, another really helpful for one for this one is opening up the fascial line on the lateral side. So you can have them hold on to a bar and take their other leg across and then glide it open. So you're kind of that gliding um, idea as well that you're opening up the fascia on that side. Um, for our inner thighs, um, I think we probably know a lot of stretches and mobilizers for our inner thighs. If kids have a really tight inner thigh, a really helpful one is just taking a really wide parallel second, feeling like you have a triangle for your pelvis and then pointing the point of the triangle towards the inside of your foot. And that's again, we're just kind of gliding open in this area and coming back, and gliding open and coming back. Um, you can also add a reach to the foot to give a little bit more stretch. Another one that I really like is taking a side lunge and then moving back and forth 
between the sides, kind of, again, gliding that stretch open. Um, <clears throat> we can also do trigger point releases for our inner thigh, where you can have students sit down and feel along their inner thigh for a point that's really tight. And they're just going to press into it and hold and breathe and breathe and breathe until it releases, which takes usually about 30 seconds, kind of have them go down their inner thigh. That's a really good one if they're super tight. Um, 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 then I think I put that, oh, sorry, one more stretch for the inner thigh. Um, you can kind of have them go, it's not really a frog stretch. You wanna have the knees a little bit more forward. We're kind of opening up this way and pressing back into the inner thigh. Um, and I have posterior hip here, that shouldn't be there. That should be up at the next <laughs> column. So posterior hip or the back of the hip. Um, again, this one is really important for turnout to the front. If we have restrictions here, it's gonna really affect that turnout because that's the area that needs to release and relax as we bring the leg forward. So a tennis ball release for the piriformis muscle, which is that muscle again between the sacrum and the hip bone, kind of right in the middle of the hip. Um, so trigger point or tennis ball release for that area. Um, stretches for the piriformis. So that's things like this um, stacked knee stretch, stretches the piriformis. And again, some students have a really hard time with this one. So if they're if you've got a kid who's like this, <laughs> sit them up on top of a yoga block or a stack of pillows again so that they can relax into it. They wanna be able to feel a stretch but not be dying <laughs> so that they can really relax into it. Um, another one is taking the knee to the center of the body and crossing it over here. We also can do stretches for our internal rotators. So that's like the knock knee stretch where you're letting the knees fall in. You can also do one leg at a time, kind of move around. It's like that dynamic stretching again. Um, we also, anything that's mobilizing the hamstrings, if the hamstrings are very tight, that's gonna affect our particularly extension, but can also affect our turnout to the front. So a really simple hamstring mobilizer, if you've got kids who are super tight, just having them step back and feel that their pelvis is reaching away from them and then coming back and then reaching. So it's that, again, gliding open feeling. So you have them do that in parallel, in turn out. So it'd be reaching this way, in turn in. So it's getting a different part of the muscle. And you can also have them do it turned out with a reach across to the opposite foot. So um, if your dancers are feeling a pinching in the groin, really um, pay attention. We'll talk more about this in our um, core, um, sorry, stabilization of the core <laughs> insights class, but correct posture and the position that they're standing in with their hips can play a really big role in if they're feeling pinching in the groin. So if uh, the two common ones, right, the students will stand like this, which tightens here and tightens here, and weakens their abdominal muscles, or they'll kind of sit with their hips forward like this and round in their upper back, which puts a lot of strain in the front of the hips. Um, so you want to look out for those, also how they're sitting. Are they sitting slumped while they're doing their schoolwork? Are they overextending? Are they really holding a good position? Um, also, a lot of dancers will stand with their hip bones kind of pushed forward in their hip socket. Um, even if they're not kind of leaning, it's just kind of a natural, I don't know why we kind of stand like that. So want to check it to see if they're doing that. And we should be able to do a little mini squat like this, feeling your hip bone and stand up and keep that bone in the middle of the hip socket without it pushing forward at the end. And, um, Again, we'll probably spend more time on that in the core stability class, but that can have a really, really big impact on turnout um, as well. So, whoop, going back. Okay, now we're getting into our stabilizing. Um, uh, so again, not going to spend that much time on core control, but um, 
we want to focus on developing core control that is um, a spontaneous, uh, I'll read this quote from Lisa Howell. This is part of her training turnout program, but she also has a lot of programs um, helping to strengthen your core. Um, she says, having effective, spontaneous, and natural core stability is essential in mastering your true turnout control. As if we, <clears throat> if we do not have a stable base, there is nothing to work your turnout from. Many dancers spend a lot of time on core exercises, which may actually be creating more tension in their hips rather than resolving them. So when we're developing um, core control, we want to focus on developing a core control that integrates the really deep stabilizing muscles. So that's like your TAs, your um, tiny little muscles in your that are in between the vertebrae in your back your diaphragm and your pelvic floor. Lisa Howell calls that your internal unit. So it's those really deep muscles and our deep muscles are built for endurance and stability. So those are the ones we wanna strengthen when we need to be holding our spine in a position for a very, very long time in ballet class. The outer muscles are helpful as well in stabilizing, but they're more acting to turn on and off as we move from different positions, um, sorry, transition from one position to another or move between different positions. So those are your rectus abdominis. Those are like your six pack abs, <laughs> um, your obliques, right? And they also work in coordination with your lats, with your glute med, with your adductors, with your QL muscles, quadratus lumborium, which is on the side of your back and your iliopsoas. So we want to try to develop a core that's those all those muscles integrating together and working in a really coordinated and natural way. So our students ha aren't having to think all the time about their core control. It should be something that their body can kind of respond to naturally. Um, and so anyway, just a note on that. We'll talk about it more in another class. <laughs> but um, when you are working to condition or to address any area in a class, I have found this um, again from Lisa Howell to be really helpful. So if we're looking at a restriction let's say in the front of the hip um, in our standing leg turnout. We want to look at how we can mobilize the body to better achieve that turnout. We want to isolate and strengthen the specific muscles that need to work to achieve that turnout. We want to think of exercises that are going to integrate that muscle with movement that we're using in ballet class. And then we want to come up with exercises that are going to address the function. And those are exercises that dancers, they're very similar maybe to ballet class exercises where they can, it's very simple. They can perform it over and over and over and over again um, repeatedly to build that habit of muscle coordination into their body. Um, another concept we want to think of is because we are working to activate and find these really deep, tiny muscles, um, we have to sort of change the way that we're getting kids to think about using their muscles. You're not really going to feel them that much because they're very small. It's not going to be like when we feel our quads, you know, working, if we're doing, you know, something with like a lot of lunges and you could really feel the muscle. That's not what this is going to be like when we're strengthening these muscles. It's more helpful to have kids feel like they're just moving the femur and rotating the bone in the hip socket as, as they need it to move with as little muscle activity as possible. Um, that's going to prevent them from gripping the gluteus maximus and other muscles that they tend to use too much. So we want to try to get those muscles to be able to um, relax a little bit more and to really isolate and strengthen the deeper muscles. In order to do that, we can't have kids feel like they're gripping and squeezing and using their muscles to go to the extent of their turnout. It really has to feel very easy, which is counterintuitive for them because they don't feel like they're working very hard. Um, but it's really important to help them understand how to isolate these muscles. So yeah, one of my favorite ways to get kids to do that is use as little muscle activity as possible and achieve more rotation. So you feel that there's more mobility, there's more availability for movement in the joint and you're using as little muscle activity as possible to get there. 
Um, important concepts to keep in mind when we're doing the conditioning overall is the things we talked about earlier is hip disassociation. When they're doing these exercises, we want to disassociate the movement from the hip. We only want them moving in the joint and not moving the pelvis at all. We want to make sure that we're continuing to have that pelvic link so that the pelvis is stable and the spine is stable while they're doing these exercises. So you're not only training the turnout, but you're also training that stability in the pelvis and then the spine at the same time. We also want to go for really precise movement and activation of specific muscles rather than just kind of doing an exercise. We're trying to help students really to visualize what muscle are you using? How exactly should your body be moving rather than kind of just going through a movement? Okay, so um, specific <laughs> exercises for isolation and integration. Um, so we've talked about the mobility, right? Mobilize, isolate, integrate function. We've already talked about the mobilizers. So now we're gonna talk about exercises for isolation and integration. Um, so for your standing leg, turn out that QF muscle is the, the most important. So you're gonna find that muscle by feeling between your sit bone and your tailbone. So it's, no, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Between your femur, head of your femur here and your sits bone. So it's quite low. It's kind of on that like leotard line of your hip. Um, so there's two versions of a side lying exercise that I like for this one. The first one, it's helpful to have something that you can put between um, your student's knees. It could be a ball or a pillow or something like that. And you wanna have them feel between that hip bone and your sits bone. So try to find that QF muscle along the leotard line. And they're gonna just gently press the heels together and they should feel a slight swell of the muscle underneath their fingers without gripping anything else. So the rest of the outer muscle should stay really soft. And as they squeeze their heel and kind of right work to turn their knee out, they should feel just a slight swell of muscle underneath their fingers. So that one's helpful to really just help them access and isolate and find that muscle. The next one, I'm sure you guys have done this one before, but you're gonna take the um, leg underneath you, the knee straight underneath the pelvis, you can support this knee on something. And then you're gonna work to turn out the bottom leg. And again, when you're doing this, you can have them feel their hip if that's helpful, but doing it with as little muscle activity as possible and no gripping in the larger hip muscles. So you're just gonna take the leg up and back down, up and back down using that little tiny muscle activity. Um, you can do like about three sets of eight eventually, work up to there. Um, the other exercise you can do is similar to the test we did to the standing leg turnout. So you're gonna have them come up against the wall and just, again, little muscle activity as possible and turn out their legs as far as they can and turn back in. And then I like to have them feel like they could go a little bit further every time. Little less muscle activity, go a little further and then come back to the center. And again, little activity, go a little bit further, come back in. So those are all really good ones to develop that strength of the QF muscle. Um, for turnout in fondue, again, I'm gonna run through these really quick. So hold any questions if you have anything. Um, a really good one is to have them lay down. Make sure that they have all really? the points. What was that? <laughs> I think it was uh, muted by mistake. Um, you're gonna have them lay in a demi-plie position and really make sure that they have the front of the pelvis on the floor. They can rest the hands on the forehead and you're just gonna have them do an isometric squeeze. So they're gonna press the heels together and down and hold that for about six counts and then relax. So press the heels together and down and hold for six counts and relax. Um, Another good one is to train turnout with a resistance band. So you're gonna tie it to something stable and then take the other end of the band and hook it around your, your foot. And then you wanna take the knee at like a 45 degree angle out from the leg. And then you're gonna work the turnout with the resistance band. Again, when they're doing this one, you can have them put their hand on their hip to make sure they're not gripping any of their bigger muscles. You really want them to try to isolate that smaller muscle as you're doing this exercise. 
Um, the next one, I'm sure a lot of you guys have done this before, the clamshell, right? This is like very typical turnout exercise. We're laying on the side and we're opening the knee and coming back in. But when they do this, really have them visualize that piriformis muscle going from the hip femur to the sacrum and like a rubber band and really help them to isolate. Don't grip any of the other muscles. They may only be able to lift their knee a little bit at first and put it back down to find that muscle. Um, for our turnout in retire, we can, we really need to strengthen the hamstring a lot of the time because students like to do this rather than actually bending in the knee. And this bending here is what's gonna help bring the toe higher. So we can focus on strengthening the hamstring. And again, you can take the um, band, mine down, secure it to something strong. You're gonna lay on your belly and just have them pull, sorry, I'm not at a good angle, there we go. Pull the band this way towards them. Don't have them do too many of these at once. Start with just like five and then build up from there. Um, the turnout exercise that with the band that I just did before is also really helpful for turnout and retire. And then you can combine them together. So you can have them lay down with the band at an angle and like kind of like it's you're coming from a tondu and alisequin position and then they're going to bend the toe up to the knee with resistance you're working the hamstring and the turnout at the same time um for retire having them lay on their side and making sure that they're not gripping in any of the muscles bringing the leg up to retire turning in Turning out again, again, keeping the pelvis stable, the spine stable, right? Um, and just using those tiny muscles to find a little bit more turnout every time. Uh, for turnout to the front, um, and then we'll talk more about this at the core control class, but we want them to be able to isolate their iliopsoas and really use that as their hip flexor. So a helpful exercise to do that is to have them lay down and put their hand on the front of the hip. We have a lot of students who will grip that tendon of their rectus femoris to lift their legs. So you wanna have them feel like they're sucking the um, head of their femur in deeper into the hip socket and then lengthening the leg out. So it's coming in in the hip socket, lengthening out in the toes, lifting up and work on keeping that front of the hip soft. So you're doing like the iliacus suck of that muscle and then reach out and lift up keeping the front of the hip soft that one's really helpful for isolating that deeper muscle um, another one you can do is have them lie on the floor kind of in a door jam put their leg off the wall in a flexed position and it's similar to the standing leg turnout exercise we're going to have them turn out the leg with as little muscle activity as possible and then turn it back in Turn out with as little muscle activity as possible and turn it back in. So they're really isolating the deeper rotators in this position rather than gripping anything um, to lift the leg. Um, for turnout to all second, and especially extensions in all second, any exercises that are strengthening the obliques are really helpful. Um, as we're holding the leg to the side, right, the obliques are helping to stabilize our rib cage and so strengthening the obliques is very helpful. Um, another one you can do, let's see if I can show it very well. Um, I don't have a good wall. <laughs> From here, you're gonna take the legs again up the wall and have them open the leg 45 degrees to the side, keeping this muscle in the front soft and then bringing it back in by feeling the inner thigh pulling to help join the legs together and all the time we're keeping this muscle in the front of the hip soft. So that can help train the leg is for the grand rond de jambe. Eventually, right, you'll be able to do, have them do two legs at a time to 45 degrees, and then eventually through the full range of motion. So they're really using the turnout in the top of the hip and opening that way. Um, let's see, laying on the ground, and doing an exercise, whoo, <laughs> there's my spinal stability, doing round de jambe on layer, laying on the ground and really focusing on using 
the little muscle activity, maximum rotation, correct placement of their pelvis, right? Um, that kind of thing. So in general, um, any floor bar exercises that you do, if you're incorporating these ideas and helping them to isolate and find those kind of muscles and think in that way, floor bar can be a really helpful way to start um, building the function exercises and integrating into movement that they're actually going to be doing in class. So floor bar would be like laying on your back and doing a développé to the front or doing a plié laying on the floor or lifting the leg like in a tendu position, those kind of exercises. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit over 10 since we started late. So I understand if you guys have to rush out, but um, yeah, so I talked about this a little bit already. Our functional exercises are simple exercises that allow dancers to perform an action repeatedly to help them form the habit of muscle coordination in their bodies. So any floor bar exercises, um, any exercises where like for the plie and fondue, you're having them making sure they're taking their knees over their toes and you can have them transfer to one leg, stretch that leg, plie, put it back down. But really simple things that are teaching them to hold the rotation in different positions. Just doing a preparation for pirouette, facing the bar, plie, and then making sure the ret rotation from ret is coming from the right place. And just have them repeat that over and over, thinking of all those concepts that we've already talked about. Okay, so moving into class and our training, what we do most of the time. Um, I think that, so in class, the way that we talk about turnout really matters. So instead of using cues like squeeze or squish, I had a, a NOAA teacher who would always say, squish the glutes, and it's so not helpful. It just <laughs> creates a lot of stiffness. So um, using words like um, spiraling, sustaining, that are encouraging student, students to think of turnout as a continuous action rather than a position of the body, because we need that ability in the hip to be able to move and turn out through positions rather than just achieve turnout in specific poses. Um, so yeah, encouraging that vocabulary to, you know, think about turnout as a movement rather than as a stiff position. Um, I think in class, we need to be really careful about applying the concept of pelvic stability and hip disassociation. So when students are doing a tendu and they're moving their whole pelvis or rond de jambe, right? And they're moving the entire pelvis to achieve the rond de jambe is we're not actually training turnout muscles. We're just training the pelvis to move like this, right? So making sure that we're keeping an eye on pelvic stability and hip disassociation as we're going through class um, and we're giving corrections to our students. Um, I think encouraging students in ballet class to bring what they've learned from their conditioning and cross training classes and applying it. So it's helping students integrate the feeling of isolating those specific muscles. Um, sorry, guys, one sec. I think someone got kicked out of the meeting. <laughs> um, so, yeah, helping. Sorry, there we go. Yeah, helping students to kind of bring that feeling, what they've discovered about their turnout muscles and cross training into class, give them those cues and opportunity to work on that in, in their ballet exercises. Um, continuing to use that like a, as little activity for maximum rotation. So um, Jackie Green ha Haas in Dance Anatomy, I liked this quote. She said, think about moving along the most efficient path. In other words, engage your core musculature for supportive placement and recruit only the muscles needed for accomplishing the movement. So I don't know if you guys have those dancers, they like try so hard and they are like almost like working in the opposite direction. So helping students to understand we wanna move in efficient way in an efficient path. Our core is working very hard. Usually our supporting leg is working very hard and the other leg should feel like it has freedom for movement and not like it's gripping and working so hard. We only wanna use the muscles that we need. And that also helps them to dance in an efficient way. They're not gonna overtire you know, tire themselves out too quickly by like using all their muscles when they don't need to. Um, so, uh, let's see, did I skip one? 
So common faults that I just wanted to run over really quickly. Again, we could have like had a 10 hour class on this, but um, common faults that I see in technique class that are related to this. Um, we talked about this a little bit already is when students move the entire, uh, sorry, what did I have? I should go with my notes. Moving the pelvis to achieve the turnout rather than really turning out from the hip. So they're, they're kind of, right? And this goes with <clears throat> that, what I was talking about earlier, where they're moving the pelvis with the leg, or when they go to the side, they're just moving the pelvis to get the leg side rather than actually turning out the leg to the side or like same to the back, right? And so we have Ronde Jones and kids are doing something like this. I'm exaggerating, <laughs> usually it's not that bad. But we really wanna train them, right, to disassociate that hip. So having them do exercises where they're turning in and turning out little muscle activity, maximum rotation to the front. Hold your hips stable to the side, turn in, don't move your hips. Minimal activity, maximum rotation right, really training the pelvis to stay stable. And then they're turning out from the hip joint rather than moving that pelvis to achieve kind of like a, like this, I call it, it's like fake turnout, right? I'm not actually turning out my leg, but my legs to the side, just kind of, I'm faking it, right? My pelvis is stable and I'm really rotating from the top of my hip. Then I'm using those deeper rotators. I'm actually turning out the leg. Um, so this brings me into a misunderstanding of our turnout to the side. Um, I have a lot of dancers who will try to turn out to the side and they kind of get into this thing where the, the hip will go back and the leg will come forward or even they'll keep the hip stable but they're, they think they're turning out and the leg is coming forward this way. Um, and what we want to isolate is the turnout from the top of the hip is a rotation of the femur. The position of the leg to the side is different. So we want our leg to be as side as they possibly can where their body allows them to and rotate the heel forward. So it's almost a feeling of rotating the femur this way and pressing the, the leg back this way. So if we don't get the leg all the way to the side and those all the compositions, what I find is the muscles in the front of the leg get really bulky and grippy. We start really gripping in that rectus femoris, that tendon here that gets really tight. The quads build up, right? We're not working in an efficient position for our body. And when we get our leg as side as we can in our bodies, we're helping, uh, we're recruiting the glutes. We're helping to recruit that deeper iliopsoas. So it's gonna build a lot better muscles and allow our students to have a lot more range of motion and flexibility and extensions and all that. Um, so another one is hip hiking. Um, and that's that in order to achieve the retire higher or the alisicon will really hike the hip up. So in retire, anything where the leg is 90 degrees and lower, the pelvis has to stay straight and the turnout comes from inside of the back of the hip and the hamstrings work to lift the toe up. So we have this really square pelvis and that's gonna be much more helpful when we're trying to do pirouettes than this and our rib cage gets pushed off the side or we'll compensate and do something funny like that, right? So really being careful to train students not to hike that hip. When they take the leg up to a la seconde, they can tilt the hip slightly this way, but we're not initiating the movement from the hip hike. We're taking the knee and we're initiating the knee. And then when I need to tilt my pelvis, it does so that I can extend my leg higher, but we're not initiating the movement from the hip. Um, another common one I see is the tucking of the pelvis under to achieve stability. And that puts a lot of gripping in our gluteus maximus. We can't really access the deep rotators if our pelvis is tucked too much. So our gluteus maximus takes over, our TFL and our glute med gets really tight and it's this bad cycle that builds bad patterns into the muscle and bad development. So um, a common times I see that is in grand plie, that students will get to the bottom, they'll tuck their pelvis under, or when they're lifting the leg to the side or the front, they'll kind of tuck the pelvis under to gain stability. So we really need to watch out for that in class. Um, the over recruiting of gluteus maximus, which we've talked about quite a bit, that um, they're not squeezing in the back of their hips to really keep the turnout, that they're really finding it from the deeper place. They're just using the lower fibers of the glute max as needed, but we're not squeezing and gripping to try to hold turnout. Um, I also find that students, right, they're 
very about their working leg and not at all paying attention to their standing leg. So we need to help them focus on achieving strong standing leg turnout because when they do that, their working leg is gonna have that ease of movement. It's gonna be much easier to turn out and move the leg through the positions. Um, and then I think that students also have a hard time focusing on true core stability or understanding of what neutral alignment really looks like in the spine. So those are just, yeah, most common things that I see in students. Um, I think in terms of how this affects our programming in our studios, conditioning and cross-training classes are like, I don't know, in my mind, non-negotiable <laughs> because you need that time to be able to break this down and help students understand what they're doing to strengthen and isolate those specific muscles. And not just for turnout, we need cross-training to develop their body as a whole, right? So especially in ballet programs, when we're working turned out so much, we need them to spend time in parallel and doing things opposite that to balance out their muscle groups. We need to spend time helping them understand how to move their core and stabilize their core and move from a, um, a, a strong core, um, things like that. So I think that if you don't have cross training classes already, see how you can try to incorporate that into your programming. Um, take time to educate your students about the anatomy of their hips and the muscles that they're using. Um, it helps students to visualize what they're actually doing. And so when they're trying to isolate that muscle, if they know where the muscle is and the two bones that are moving closer or farther apart from each other, it really helps them to find that muscle and to isolate it when they're trying to activate those deep, tiny, small muscles. Um, the third thing I would just continue guys to like continue your education. There's so many good resources out there. Just keep continuing to educate yourself and get new things and dance medicine, especially is coming such a far, has come such a far away since, you know, I was younger and, and dancing and I'm sure for you guys as well, there's been so many new things that have been coming out and good resources. So make sure you're taking advantage of, of looking at that. Um, I think it's also really important to make sure that you have a curriculum and a syllabus in your schools, that you know that you're training age appropriate things to students at a specific time when they're ready for them. Um, and kind of going along with that, there's a really important, a huge importance of methodical and patient training. So training, you know, the foundation, I'm sure you guys know, right? Like we're training the foundation and then building up from there. And don't worry about getting to here when they don't have this foundation. Be patient and make sure they have this really well. They can stand in first position, turned out really well from the right place before they start to do a releve. They can stand on flat shoes, right? And on one foot with really nicely held turnout before we take them on releve, that kind of thing. Think of it as building blocks and, and just be patient. Don't feel like you have to, you know, have the kid with their leg way up here and they look like this, right? So I just, I would really encourage that kind of thought of methodical and patient training. Um, I think in our students as well, we need to encourage them to have consistent and steady work rather than focusing on fast results. So encouraging them to do the work at home, do these exercises at home yourself, be consistent with them and be steady with them and we'll make progress. Sometimes I think that's why it's helpful to take those measurements when we're doing the tests of the restrictions. Um, test it, have them do your turnout whatever program for six to eight weeks and have them test again so they can really have a, a visual knowledge of where they're where they've been and where they are right now um, I think that's very helpful because it's hard to see when we're having this tiny tiny steps at a time to see the progress over a long period kids can get discouraged but I think those like snapshots in time this is where you were and this is where you are can be helpful in encouraging them to work that way Okay, so last thing, and then we'll have a few questions. Um, the My favorite resources um, for this kind of um, work, uh, first of all, Lisa Howell. She has so many good things. She has free articles um, and resources on her website. She has a blog. She has a YouTube channel. Um, she also has resources you can pay for. Um, it's like $40 for her, I think, um, I'm trying to think of one with the 
she has some resources that are just a PDF that you can buy and download. Um, and then she has other resources that have a PDF, but then also like a membership video area. And it's like $40 for the PDF and access to this membership area for the rest of your life um, for each resource. So it's very affordable and was so worth it <laughs> to get it. Um, she has turnout resources, core resources, point resources, all that kind of thing. She also has online teacher training. Um, some other good um, books that I pulled for from for this PowerPoint are Dance Anatomy by Jackie Green Haas. Um, dance Anatomy is like goes through all of the basic anatomy that you need to know for dance and then also gives you exercises to strengthen the specific muscles and concepts that they're talking about. So that one's really helpful in a very um, building your knowledge in a very practical way. Um, Inside Ballet Technique is just a very good kind of overview of what we need to be thinking about in, in technique in um, terms of anatomical sense and where are we going with our training. Um, anatomy of Movement is a good book, is basically just an anatomy book, but it has really good pictures and, um, you know, these are the muscles, these are what the muscles do kind of in a very simple way. So um, that's it. <laughs> that was a lot of information, but I'll open it up for a few questions. Um, if you guys have any, let me stop the sharing so I can see you all better. So yeah, if you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and, and pop in. Would you wait until students are about eight years old before discussing these concepts? Yeah, I think, yeah, by, I just realized I'm really dark. Um, there we go. By age, yeah, I think eight, they're able to much better understand it. It's not that you can't work them in a turned out position, but we're not really, I think really by six years old, they can start to understand and focus a little bit more, but we're not trying to push the turnout. We're just kind of getting them to work where there are more focus on training the legs to be nice and straight and have them you know, flexing and pointing your feet, stretch and bend your knees <laughs> and stabilizing their core, actually getting them to have a, not this position, right? Um, so kind of the, the more basic things. And then you can work in turnout, but we're not kind of like pushing the turnout at that point. Um, yeah, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then again, with, with students, we always wanna start them on the floor first, start their training with a floor bar or a program like PBT, something like that, and then stand them up at the bar on two feet, have them do it at the bar on two feet, facing the bar, then one hand on the bar, then on one leg, then in the center. So you're building your training that way. How would you explain the concept of keeping your hips still on the tendu so that you can focus on the turnout to like a younger dancer or a new dancer who doesn't quite understand the technological concepts? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I think um, some of the analogies that have been helpful for me are, I, I feel like this is a really old one, getting your box from your square, you know, your shoulders to your hips and we're not moving that box, kind of helping them to just visualize their body in terms of like a shape, right, that they're, that they're in and that they're maintaining. Um, and then I think, yeah, as we do that, just, I think, uh, for the younger kids, helping them think in terms of like shapes are helpful. This is your square, don't ruin your square. They know what a square is and they know what a box is and so they can understand how to maintain that. And then um, continuing to emphasize their um, joint as like a hinge. So you can use an example like a door on a hinge. The wall doesn't move, but the door moves from the hinge. So they're only moving their leg from the kind of hinge sort of joint. Different analogies like that, I think, can help um, helping them to yeah, um, see something that already works that way and then trying to get their body to accomplish the same movement. Does that make sense? That's great. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, guys? Okay, awesome. I we're like way over, I think, our allotted time. So I'll let you guys go. But um, if there are any other questions, please 
email us. And if there's other, you know, topics that you're interested in having these insights classes, please let us know so um, we can give you guys the resources that you need. So um, thanks for joining us this morning. It was good to virtually e meet all of you and um, hope this was helpful and um, that you guys have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, that was great. Thank you. Thank you.